Right. Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine's Grand Rounds. Today we have a, a very special talk with Dr. Mikos. Um, so thank you so much for, for being here. Before we, we get to the, to the main event, I also wanted to thank the Mendelssohn family, of course, for making this lectureship possible. Um, we have a few Mendelssohn family members, many generations of doctors here in the audience. So thank you all for coming and thank you for this generous gift. For those who, who don't know Dr. Mendelssohn, um, he was a, an expert clinician, a master educator who dedicated much of his life, mo more than a 50 year career, predominantly working here at WashU and Jewish and Barnes hospitals. And he was truly one of the grand round stalwarts. Um, as Dr. Mendelssohn was sharing with us just earlier today, he, he attended every week for, for decades, had a, almost a, seemed like an assigned seat in the back and then would attend via Zoom when he was unable to be here in person. So it's wonderful to be able to, to continue this tradition. And before we hand it over to Dr. Mikos, I will hand it over to Dr. Prabhu, who's going to give us a little bit of an introduction. So good morning. It's uh, really my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, today's Mendelssohn speaker, uh, Dr. Aaron Mikos. Uh, Dr. Mikos uh, completed her medical school at Northwestern and then did her internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins where she has been now for more than 20 years, uh, rising through the ranks. Uh, she's now the associate professor uh, in the division of cardiology with a joint appointment in epidemiology at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she holds several leadership positions there, including uh, the uh, director of women's uh, cardiovascular health research and the associate director of uh, preventive cardiology in the Ciccaroni Center at Hopkins. Uh, it's uh, hard to uh, overstate Dr. Mikos's influence in uh, preventive cardiology. She is uh, recognized as a, a national and international leader in the field. Uh, she's co-editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Preventive Cardiology. She's an associate editor for circulation and a member of the board of directors for the uh, American Society of Preventive Cardiology and a member of the ACC, American College of Cardiology uh, Prevention Leadership Council. She's uh, uh, very well uh, known for her research, which uh, revolves around um, lipids and lipid lowering treatment and cardiovascular health in women and the intersection between diabetes, cardiometabolic disease, and cardiorenal disease. She's authored more than 600 publications and 11 book chapters, and she's been a prolific mentor, having uh, uh, trained over 60 individuals in uh, specific areas of uh, prevention research over her career. And uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, uh, have her come uh, here for the Mendelssohn Lecture and uh, give us uh, a presentation on lipid management and the tools we have available. Here. Thank you for this kind introduction and for the invitation to come. I'm so honored to give the Mendelssohn Lectureship and to talk about this topic in uh, the home of uh, Wash you, where uh, Dr. Ann Goldberg is somebody who I've looked up to in the lipid field. I'm going to be citing some of her work, and um, you know, hopefully, I'm sure she's taught you all in your department about lipids. But hopefully, I can reinforce what she's taught you and give you from a cardiology perspective because this has actually been an exciting field. There's been um, a lot of new agents now, and we have newer targets. So making sure everybody is sort of up to speed on this. And I do have some disclosures which are related to lipid therapeutics. So there is overwhelming evidence that LDL cholesterol is causally related to the pathogenesis of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And multiple lines of evidence from observational studies, genetic studies, randomized clinical trials, animal experiments. And this is why LDL is still the primary target and why lower LDL for longer is uh, the, uh, the mantra, the, the, the rule for prevention. And this is really highlighted here by the sort of proportional lowering that if you look at the magnitude of LDL lowering, uh, it's proportional to the magnitude of reduction in coronary risk. Um, but it's not only that, it's also the shows the evidence of importance of having lower for longer. Because if you look at the data from genetic studies, 
And then you, I just put a line here at one millimole per liter of LDL lowering around 39 milligrams per deciliter. That for every one millimole lower um, from you know genetic studies, you see a 50% reduction in coronary disease because these individuals have had lower LDL from birth. Um, compared to lowering uh, interventional studies from randomized clinical trials, where the duration is usually around five years, where you see a 20% reduction. So there's still a proportional reduction for a lower you get for LDL, but if you've had lower for longer, we see a greater uh, magnitude of reduction. And I, I like this schematic here that kind of um, puts it uh, in, in perspective. You know, we're all comfortable sort of thinking about pack years of smoking. Um, so not only the magnitude of burden of smoking, but the years people smoked. And the same thing to think about cholesterol years. Um, if there's a theoretical onset of, of clinical ASCVD, some people think this is maybe around 5,000 milligrams per deciliter uh, years. Um, you know, individuals who have FH, familial hypocholesterolemia, you know, they cross over this threshold early in life because they have had uh, th th this high burden uh, earlier compared to individuals who have had lifelong low LDL from favorable genetics, healthy lifestyle, they may never cross this clinical threshold for ASCVD. But I really wanna highlight the importance of this modest or moderate hyperlipidemia that often gets ignored in clinical practice. But individuals who have even modestly elevated LDLs, you know, 130s to 160s, if they've had this for a long enough period of time, they too will have earlier onset ASCVD compared to their counterparts that have had lifelong lower LDL. And perhaps we should be thinking about you know, treating earlier. Now this is data, this is the European guidelines. And I'm mentioning this now because the updated sort of recommendation clinical decision pathway from the American College of Cardiology that I'm gonna talk about um, kind of more mirrors um, what the Europeans had put forth a few years ago where um, you know, this is, is uh, based on risk, but there's two targets. You know, there is both a 50% reduction in LDL from baseline, but also um, LDL targets based on risk with the highest risk individuals recommending to achieve a target less than 55 milligrams per deciliter. And in the European guidelines, not only is this clinical ASCVD, people who've had an event, but also unequivocal evidence of ASCVD from imaging studies like SCT, uh, coronary angiography um, showing disease. And then for high risk individuals, um, you know, target less than 70. So we'll show how the ACC pathway is similar to this. And I'm going to be mostly focusing about LDL, a little bit like Pritchell A, but really um, keep in mind that the, these, the ApoB lipoprotein family, this is the atherogenic family. I think about B for bad. Um, uh, LDL makes up about 90% of ApoB. We're going to talk about this emerging target, lipoprotein A, that has an ApoB moiety and also this ApoA moiety. Uh, but also um, as a secondary target, these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins that um, the remnants and ALDL, ALDL and DLDL that are sort of um, captured by non-HDL, uh, these all also have an ApoB moiety. And really when we sort of measure serum triglycerides, it's sort of um, a sort of a surrogate marker for this TRLs. And it's probably not the triglyceride that's the problem. It's probably just the, the cholesterol that these larger particles carry, but that is also a secondary target. So here's our timeline uh, for hyperlipidemia management. And why I'm excited about this is, you know, for a long time, you know, it was used to be statins was the only tool that we have. And now we have a lot more tools at our disposal. But the first statin was approved in 1987, lobostatin. And then we didn't really have much for 15 years until azetamide was approved. And then uh, nothing again for about 13 years until um, the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies, alarocumab and evolocumab were approved. And in 2018, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, multi-society released their cholesterol guidelines that incorporated um, for the first time some of these non-statin therapies like azetamide and PCSK9 for patients at very high risk. But since those guidelines were released in 2018, we've actually had three new agents that have been FDA approved for LDL lowering. Um, I'm going to talk about um, benthodoic acid, and Dr. Goldberg led uh, some of these pivotal trials, uh, oral agent, um, and clizarin, um, uh, and uh, not on the slide is ifenocumab, which is um, approved for homozygous FH. Um, and then the last year, the American College of Cardiology had released, it's not a guideline, but I think it's helpful, this expert um, clinical decision pathway about how to incorporate some of these non-statin therapy, and I'm going to review that with you today.
But taking a step back, um, statins still remain our first line therapy for primary and secondary prevention because of overwhelming evidence. Uh, but unfortunately, events still occur on statin treated patients, both in primary prevention and secondary prevention. We see the, the statin um, event rates here in the blue bars. And so there's still events occurring. Now, certainly some of this residual risk is from other factors. And that's why you need a multi-pronged approach, you know, control blood pressure, control their cardiometabolic risk, smoking, all those things. But we know that some of the residual risk is also due to residual um, burden of atherogenic particles and uh, further lowering that can further lower risk. And some of the three pivotal trials that showed um, outcome reduction with non-statin therapy added to statins was first the Improve It trial, looking at azetamide added to a moderate intensity statin, statin simvastatin. Um, you know, this was in uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome. And you can see here in both the arms that, you know, both groups had a 30% uh, recurrent event rates. You know, event rates are very high in patients with ACS. And all of the absolute, um, the, the, the relative risk reduction was only 6%. Um, because the absolute risk is so high, you would only need to treat 50 patients with azetamide on top of a statin to prevent one vascular event because so many events are occurring. And then we have the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies for your evaluated stable ACVD patients um, with evolocumab uh, showing about a 2% absolute risk reduction and a 15% relative risk reduction. But the trials were stopped you know, fairly early, you know, at two to three years, and the curves are starting to widen. And I, I'll show you some of the, the legacy um, data um, from uh, extended follow-up. And that same thing with um, alirocumab in patients with acute coronary syndrome similar um, absolute risk reduction and uh, relative risk reduction. So this really just shows that, yes, if you can further push the LDL down, you can further lower event rates. But um, you know, this gets to how the guidelines stratify risk stratification and secondary prevention. There's certainly a difference between someone who's maybe had a stent um, 10 years ago and is stable versus patients in your CCU with acute coronary syndrome. Um, and indeed, in four-year sub-analysis did show that there was a greater relative and absolute risk reduction with higher risk patients. So patients with a more recent MI or multiple MIs on multivessel disease derive greater benefit from evolocumab, a PCSK9 inhibitor, compared to their more stable counterpoints. And this is why when I get to the guideline algorithms, there's this focus on identifying patients at very high risk um, to uh, um, who maybe uh, particularly um, derive the most benefit from lower LDL. And also, the data for emphasizing um, lower for longer is better. Um, recently, the four-year trial um, released their um, open label extension data. Um, so at the end of the trial, which was you know, just a little over uh, two, two years, um, everybody uh, in the placebo arm got, you know, uh, could be switched to evolocumab. And so we see here in the treated arms that the PCSK9 inhibitors, you know, they have a 60% reduction in LDL. In fact, the median LDL in the trial was 30. So half the patients in the trial, you know, got uh, below LDL of 30. So at the end of the trial, um, the individuals were switched. And so the placebo arm now being treated also got down to 30. But when you follow them out, there was continued um, reduction, 15% reduction in the people who had gotten evolocumab during the trial and during the open label extension out to five years compared to people who now had their LDL down to 30, but um, you know, had, did not, uh, was treated with placebo initially. So this just showed by you know, treating them even earlier that even those two, three years of legacy effect of even having lower LDL for longer had continued benefits. So we need to get, um, not wasting time and get people treated sooner. So in meta-analysis, such as this one that I was part of, um, looking at 53 trials, over 300,000 patients across all these lipid-lowering therapies with outcome data, statins, azetamide, PCSK9, we show a pretty consistent reduction for every one millimole liter um, uh, a reduction LDL, about a 15% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events with no interaction by sex. Uh, women tend to be uh, undertreated, yet they uh, equally risk women benefit just as much as um, men do. Um, but this really shows that if you can, it's really not necessarily the magical properties of statins. It's all about the LDL lowering and across all these therapeutics. If you can lower LDL, you can lower risk. But we have an exciting era with a lot more new targets. And I'm going to talk 
about some of these today, particularly the ones that are FDA approved, but also some of these emerging therapies um, for lipoprotein little a. But we really have had an evolution. We have um, oral therapies now um, that are approved, and uh, I'm not talking about it today, but there's even an investigation about an oral PCSK9 that's moving along in development and trials. We have our monoclonal antibodies that I'll talk about. We have uh, under investigation um, antisense uh, oligonucleotides. So this is a single strand um, that uh, interferes um, with production of the target protein. Um, I'll be talking about it in reference to lipoprotein A. We have small interfering RNA, uh, which is a double strand, again, uh, blocking interference of this target protein, whether it be a PCSK9 or lipoprotein A. And this is a little bit more stable than the single strand, so this can be dosed. Um, less frequently, like every six months. And then there's um, exploration with vaccination and moving along in development is actually a group working on gene editing. Um, they were able to use CRISPR to eliminate PCSK9 and at least in baboons, um, it seems like it's the baboons are drifting, working really well with really low levels of LDL. So whether this will be in prime time in the, the in humans and may not be too far off in the future, this uh, what we originally thought was sci-fi may actually be reality in the future. So again, LDL is our main target. Um, we're also focusing on non-HDL, which is our secondary target that includes those triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and then lipoprotein little a, our new target. And I'm going to go over these in more details, but just sort of the schematic that pempidoic acid, this oral medicine, works uh, in the liver uh, in the same pathway as statins sort of upstream of where statins inhibit to block cholesterol synthesis. Um, and again, when you block cholesterol synthesis, you upregulate LDL receptors to uh, increase circulation of LDL, uh, uh, remove more LDL out of circulation. Um, we have agents now um, in, in trials um, targeting, uh, preventing the production of lipoprotein little a. Uh, we have our PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies that's hitting PCSK9, as well as in glycerin which um, blocks uh, the uh, uh, synthesis targets, uh, knocks out the uh, um, production of the PCSK9 protein. Um, if you're not familiar, PCSK9 is a protein involved in the degradation of the LDL receptor. So if you knock out PCSK9, you're going to have more LDL receptors on the surface of your liver to clear up that LDL out of circulation. And um, this has uh, been a very hot topic for um, therapies, uh, really based on genetic studies that show that people who have um, uh, genetic mutations, uh, loss of function in PCSK9, have um, very uh, low levels of LDL and uh, very low rates of coronary disease, where gain of function of PCSK9 is um, one of the FH phenotypes. So um, one of the new FDA approved agents is pempidoic acid. Um, this is a oral medicine um, that works by inhibiting ATP citrase lyase, ACL, in the cholesterol synthesis pathway. So it works upstream um, uh, where statins inhibit um, HMG coase reductase. But again, by blocking cholesterol synthesis, you can have more LDL receptors and clear more LDL out of circulation. Now, this is a prodrug, and so it's activated in the liver, not in muscle tissue. So it doesn't have the same statin-associated muscle symptoms, um, the same muscle symptoms that have been associated with statins. So it offers a lot of promise, potentially, in patients who are reporting statin intolerance. And uh, indeed, I'll refer to the, the outcome data, which specifically enrolled patients who have uh, statin intolerance. And it was approved in February 2020 by the FDA um, for... Um, based on its LDL lowering effects in patients with ASCVD or heterozygous FH. It's dosed 180 milligrams daily um, by itself or as a fixed dose combination with a zetamide 10 milligrams daily. So this was the, um, the data that led to the FDA approval of bempidoic acid. So um, uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, led the Claire Wisdom trial. Uh, these are um, in patients who were treated with statins, also on top of statins. Bempidoic acid, you know, can confer about a 17, 18% placebo-corrected reduction in LDL. It's also been looked in patients with statin intolerance um, who have somewhat a little bit greater, about a 25% or so reduction in um, LDL. You have a little bit greater reduction um, when you're not on a statin because this works in the same pathway as statins. And then in combination with azetamide, uh, there's even a greater reduction, about a 38% placebo-corrected difference. 
Um, and so this is now getting in the range of what you might see with modern intensity statins. And again, it's a, a potential offers promise for patients that are statin intolerant. The one thing that's been, um, we know that statins with uh, especially high intensity statins can bump the blood glucose a little bit by five milligrams per deciliter. And so a lot of patients are worried about the diabetes effects with statins, which first of all, statins don't take someone who's euglycemic and make them diabetic. Um, but for patients that are right on the border, on the pathway already there, who have prediabetes and elevated BMI, it can bump the A1C enough that they cross over into diabetes. And I know a lot of patients are worried about this. Of course, there's still tremendous benefit for statins regardless of that. But Bepidoic acid, at least in the data we have available, and we're going to have a lot more data next month when the, the outcome data is presented, but um, did not seem to have a, 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 a glucose effect. In fact, uh, there seemed to be a, a less uh, a new onset diabetes and um, less bump in A1C with bepidoic acid. Um, but this is going to be the pivotal trial that's slated to present at ACC, which is the first week of March. So we'll have a, a lot more data then. Uh, but the Clear Outcomes trial uh, is the outcome trial for bempidoic acid and enrolled both primary and secondary prevention patients, which I think that's going to be really helpful to get a label indication for primary prevention, but enrolled patients who were statin intolerant, whose LDLs remained above 100. They could be on a little bit of statin. They just couldn't be not enough on the statin to control their LDL. Randomized the bempidoic acid versus placebo, and it was powered for four-point mace. So earlier um, this year, there was an announcement um, from the company that the trial did meet its endpoint. They said, quote, that there was a clinically significant, statistically significant reduction in MACE. So I don't know what that means. We're going to find out when it's presented, um, you know, how much of a reduction and whether it's right on that pathway that we think for the proportion of LDL lowering or whether it's actually greater because there is some CRP lowering. Um, this is going to be presented um, next month, so we'll find out. And so we'll also see things related to the diabetes and also some of the side effects that um, people were concerned about, such as tendon rupture. Now, another um, agent that was FDA approved is enclosurin. So I, I've talked about what PCSK9 does. So enclosurin is a small interfering RNA that um, targets uh, the PCSK9 protein. And it's really interesting how they've you know, engineered this now to, to get these agents to the right place in the liver. It's conjugated to the Galinax, so it's um, uh, taken up by the ASPG receptor. Um, with the small interfering RNA, they're double-stranded, so there's a, a passenger strand that um, gets degraded, and the guide strand uh, uh, becomes part of this risk complex and basically leads to degradation of the PCSK9 mRNA, so it never gets to be made into this protein. And so by inhibiting PCSK9, there's more LDL receptors on the liver and again, clears more LDL out of circulation. Um, let's see, why is this not advancing? Sorry, I got stuck. Um, is somebody able to help me um, advance? I'm trying, there's an error. Um, that's funny. So, um, Okay, <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is because it is, um, the, the way it's dosed is at uh, baseline and three months um, initially, and then after the baseline three months dose is every six months after that. So it really offers advantage for, potentially for adherence. Um, let me scroll down to here. <coughs> yeah, sorry about the technical problems. I don't know what happened, but. Um, and get it on the screen. So um, in the Orion series of Orion 9, 10, and 11, these were, um, again, the trials that got it FDA approved for LDL lowering and old patients with ASCVD and heterozygous FH, we see a time average 50% reduction in LDL. So again, with twice a year dosing, um, just you know, one more time a year than from a flu shot, um, this has a lot of potential for, especially younger individuals with FH, um, having more sustained LDL control. And I'm going to talk about lipovirtual A, but both enclosurin and the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies do have some modest effect of lipovirtual A lowering. So uh, again, it's, um, uh, it's approved for ASCVD or heterozygous FH who require additional LDL reduction on top of a maximal tolerated statin. And after the initial dose in three months, dose is dosed every six months. And it's a different sort of business model where it's given in the clinic setting, so it's not something patients take at home. Um, it's given in an infusion setting or a, a clinic setting. 
Um, the five-year safety data from those trials have been published as good safety data so far. Just like all the injectables, there can be some um, injection site reactions, but no other major um, serious things have emerged yet. Um, and we're waiting on the outcome trials. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. But um, cardiovascular outcomes have was collected as safety endpoints, and this is certainly not the same as a design cardiovascular outcome trial. But it was reassuring that in the data that's been collected about events that there was uh, much fewer events in patients with enclosure versus placebo. So going along with what we would anticipate that if you can lower LDL, you can lower risk of major vascular events. And there's two um, large outcome trials ongoing now um, in patients, these were secondary prevention patients, um, they're event-driven trials, but they're anticipated to be uh, approved, uh, completed in about 2026, 2027. So we'll have outcome data that for that. So kind of putting it on um, a little bit slide, we still have bile acid sequestrins. Um, uh, we you know, don't use them a lot. We get about 18% reduction in LDL because they often have a lot of GI side effects and we have other more potent, better tolerated, but we do, are, do use them in certain populations. You can use them in pregnancy because they're not systemically absorbed. Azetamide, about 18% reduction LDL by itself, about 25% when combined with a statin. The PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies, about a 60% reduction LDL. Bepidoic acid, again, about 18% um, percent maybe by itself, but 38% when combined with azetamide. And in closer in about a 50% reduction. So you definitely see much greater LDL lowering with the PCSK9 inhibitors. And in terms of side effects, um, most of these are well tolerated. The injectables have those uh, injection site reactions. Bempidoic acid um, has been associated with increased uric acid. Um, so there is some precautions in patients with gout and follow the uric acid levels. And um, whether this is spurious or not, some of the earlier studies had suggested possible tendon rupture. It's in the FDA label. There isn't a specific mechanism for this, although we also see this with statins. And it may be people who have very high um, LDL levels um, have xanthomas that when you lysol that cholesterol, that may uh, potentially, you know, weaken the, the tendon. But we will see with a large, um, you know, 14,000 person outcome trial, whether this pans out um, and results when that's presented. So I want to move to um, how, so in uh, last year, the American College of Cardiology, because we have all these new agents that really weren't in the guidelines before, and they, they gave some guidance, these patient solution sets about how and what patients would you add these non-statin therapy. And just a reminder, I want to just go back and remind you who are the key populations that first are indicated for statins before we talk about the non-statins. But secondary prevention, clinical ACVD, persons with diabetes, persons with severe primary hypercholesterolemia, LDL is above 190, and primary prevention at elevated risk. And so prim pure primary prevention is no SCVD, no severe hypercholesterolemia or diabetes. Well, within each of these groups, there's further risk assessment. Um, uh, tweaking for risk assessment because the idea is you want to match the intensity of therapy to the absolute risk of the patient because patients at higher risk derive a greater benefit. And when, when we're talking about high intensity statins, we're talking about statins that lower LDL by 50% or more, and that's uh, really your Atorva 40 to 80 or Resuva 20 to 40. So moving to secondary prevention, even in secondary prevention, there's risk assessment. So I talked about the very high risk category. So who are those? Those are patients who've had a recent major event, like an ACS event, history of MMI, ischemic stroke, PAD, who have um, even one of these with two high-risk conditions that are so common in these patients, like being older age, CKD, diabetes, hypertension, uh, a number of these factors. And so these are the patients you want to treat more, most intensively. And I'm going to go over some of the flow algorithms from this guideline, but some of these pathways here um, it's important that they are endorsing sort of a dual goal. The first goal is still 50% reduction in your LDL. So that's your first goal is you want to reduce their LDL from baseline by 50%. But then you want to try to achieve these targets. And if you're above these targets, um, that's when the non-statin therapy can be added. And so um, this kind of now mimics the European guidelines. So patients with AACVD who are at that very high risk that I showed you, we want to get under 55 um, the non-HDL is about 30 milligrams per deciliter higher than the LDL goal. Patients with ASCVD, not at very high risk, it's less than 70. Patients with ASCVD with FH, because FH itself is a risk enhancer and they have so much higher risk, they're similar to the very high risk group of less than 55. Um, without FH, it's less than 70. And then I'll talk about 
primary severe hyperlipidemia where the uh, uh, LDL uh, goal is less than 100. And again, if you're not at these targets, that's where you add the non-statin therapy. So all these algorithms sort of set up the same. This is again, adults with ACVD at very high risk. You want the 50% reduction LDL and you wanna get down to 55. So low, much lower targets now. And because they're starting, they're so high risk, do we really considering, uh, you're not there on statins alone, considering uh, zetamine and PCSK9 uh, upfront. Um, they do give options that you can, as an alternative, consider bempedoic acid, or you can substitute inclizarin for the PCSK9 monoclonal antibody. Once you re do reduce your threshold, you're not done. You need to continue monitoring their LDL, their encouraging lifestyle. Every time you make a dose change, you should be rechecking your LDL like four to six weeks. Um, uh, and then once you're stable, uh, to continue monitoring the LDL, because if the LDL suddenly goes up, it may be that they're not adherent anymore. So you do have to continue to monitor. They do also give the option for, as part of shared decision-making, you can make the decision for no additional medications. Um, if you're having trouble reaching the threshold to refer to a lipid specialist like Dr. Goldberg, um, and, and help from a registered dietitian, um, for patients with ASCVD, not at very high risk. So this is your secondary prevention. That's not this acute coronary syndrome, the very high risk. Um, the target is less than 70. They prioritize the zetamide a little bit more upfront before getting to the injectables because um, they're not at very high risk. But again, you ha can have your PCSK9 or your monoclonal um, inclizarin to replace that. Uh, but the same kind of pathway, you need to continue to monitor and consider referral to a, a decision a lipid specialist. For patients with ASCVD and um, LDL above 190, but without FH, the target is less than 70. Again, this is all in the, the, the guideline if you want to, um, uh, the, the pathway if you want to look at the flow charts. Again, uh, because they're starting with LDL so high, in order to get down to these really intensive targets, you have to be more intensive with the treatment. So using these more potent agents like PCSK9 to, uh, are often needed to get to these targets. And then FH itself is... Um, a, a risk enhancing factor. You know, we know people who have one of the pathogenic genes, you know, they were, you know, 22 fold more likely to have an ASCVD event compared to people who have LDL above 190 without a gene where it was six fold more likely compared to people whose LDLs are less than 130. So this is a risk enhancing. And so those targets are less than 55. And when you're looking at FH in addition to your PCSK9 inhibitors, um, if you're still having trouble reaching your threshold, there are some uh, uh, other agents for, particularly for homozygous FH, even octomab, lamidipide, um, you have your LDL apheresis. Um, but again, this is done by, uh, under care of a lipid specialist. Some of these like lamidipide, you have to be part of a risk evaluation uh, mitigation strategy, REMS program. So the point for the, you know, the medicine audience is that be really thinking about combination therapy. We do this for blood pressure, right? If someone's blood pressure is 160, we're sort of thinking about two agents out of the, the door instead of just one. So if you know where you need to go and you're more than 50% above your target, start thinking about early onboarding combination therapy. Combination therapy is solely, sorely underutilized. Um, a lot of patients are just on statin alone and they don't have their LDL goal. And we have a lots of options now, as I went over, for combination therapy. And you don't have to wait three months to recheck. I tend to look a little bit early, but check every six to 12 weeks, every time you intensify to their goal is achieved and then continue monitoring after that. So that was secondary prevention. I want to talk about some of the other groups. So for diabetes, um, the guideline says that all patients above 40 with diabetes are recommended for at least a moderate intensity statin. So you don't have to calculate their 10 year risk score to make a decision about statins. They're recommended for a statin. But if they have um, diabetes and other risk factors, you want to use a high intensity statin with the aim of reducing LDL by 50% or more. In addition to the risk factors you know about, there's also diabetes specific risk enhancing, such as having longer duration of diabetes, albinuria. Uh, CKD, retinopathy, neuropathy, a low ABI. This again would benefit from a high intensity statin in patients with diabetes. And then there's um, the severe hypercholesterolemia, the LDL is above 190. As I mentioned, this is enriched with patients with FH. Be considering FH. Um, again, FH is in one in 250 people, heterozygous FH, so it's pretty common. So chances are, if you have more than you know, 200 patients in your clinic panel, you have somebody with FH but it's not recognized and it's important to recognize it because it has implications for a cascade screening and they're also at greater risk than just their LDL value alone, presumably because they've had it 
high since birth, which is why they're so much higher risk. But again, you wanna, this is primary prevention now, 50% reduction LDL, targeting an LDL under 100, and because you need it, they're often starting so high, uh, again, thinking about these PCSK9 inhibitors, or um, you can also, there's other agents um, in conjunction with a lipid specialist. So then there's primary prevention in patients who don't have any of these things, ASCVD, diabetes, or don't have severe hyperlipidemia. And this is where you again start with your risk assessment. So I was part of the 2019 ACCHA guideline. And, um, you know, we did recommend still starting with the pooled cohort equations to estimate 10 year risk. And we acknowledge that there's a lot of factors not in this. And this uh, 10 year risk score can both over and underestimate risk in certain populations. So that's why it doesn't end with the 10 year risk score. But you need a starting point to start the risk discussion. Those who are at low risk, less than 5% 10 year risk, often lifestyle modifications is enough. High risk patients above 20% 10 year risk, you want to be thinking about lifestyle plus high intensity statins, lower LDL by 50% or more. But then there's this whole group in the middle of borderline or intermediate risk, where it's really important to have a clinician patient risk discussion and consistent talk about, think about risk enhancing factors that are not in this risk score. And I'll get to calcium scores in a minute. But these are this risk enhancing factors that you're already often clinically um, available to you from their history that put patient into a higher risk category that would favor initiation of statins for pure primary prevention. And this is having a family history of premature ASCVD, having chronic inflammatory conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, these female specific factors. And I do a lot of women's health, so I'm really glad this is in the guidelines, but having early menopause or a high risk pregnancy history, um, such as having a prior history of preeclampsia. This does put um, people in a higher risk category. Having um, elevated LDL above 160. So above 190 is already an indication for statins, but if it's above 160 for borderline or intermediate risk, that certainly favors statin therapy. Having a high risk race ethnicity, South Asian ancestry, kidney disease, metabolic syndrome. And if measured, um, having any of these biomarkers, like having a high CRP above two, having a high lipoprotein A above 125 nanomoles per liter, or an ApoB above 130 milligrams per deciliter, or low ABI, this all puts patients into a higher risk category when we're thinking about lowering their vascular risk and um, using statin therapy. But the guidelines acknowledge that in many cases, after you estimate 10-year risk, um, and consider those risk enhancing factors, there can still be uncertainty about the net benefit of statin therapy, or there can be a lot of patient um, indecision, a lot of patient reluctance with starting a statin. And in these cases, a coronary calcium score and primary prevention can be very helpful to refine risk a little better and guide shared decision making. You're probably um, familiar with this test, um, it's done by non contrast CT. It's very low radiation, so it's not the same as like a full chest CT but one millisievert is the same as about a mammogram or the background radiation of walking around in the environment for a year. So as plaque is building up in the arteries, a certain percentage of it can become calcified. Um, so it's, it's, a mark, it's a good marker of uh, atherosclerotic burden um, and calcium can show up bright on x-ray without any kind of dye. And it turns out that in multiple epidemiology cohorts, including the MESA study, it really has emerged as a superior prognostic marker of risk. It predicts risk better than LDL, better than age, better than risk scores, better than a lot of these other biomarkers like CRP and things like that, because it's actually detecting that there's disease there already. So it's really integrating a lifetime of exposure between traditional and novel risk factors and genetics. Um, and the presence or absence of disease, you can both up risk uh, or de-risk an individual to uh, guide decisions about statin therapy. And this is data such as um, from the MESA study that I was involved in looking at, you know, there was nearly 7,000 individuals who had calcium scores at baseline and followed for 10 years. And I mean, just focusing on the women here, but it, it works in both um, sexes. This red line is the 7.5% 10 year risk threshold. And we generally think this is a net benefit for statins, a high enough risk where there's a net benefit for statins. So individuals with a zero score have a very low risk over 10 years. Now note that this is not no risk. There are some events here. So um, a zero score is not the same as no risk, but it's low enough risk that patients and their clinicians, if that's their desire, may feel comfortable deferring statin therapy and reassessing the calcium score in five years. 
But on the other hand, any non-zero score crosses over this threshold within a 10-year period in a graded fashion, that the higher the score, the higher the risk. So the guidelines recommend statin therapy for anybody whose calcium score is above 100 or above the 75th percentile for age and gender. Um, but it can be considered, and this is how I do it in my practice, for any non-zero score, any non-zero score is a greater risk than a zero score because it's detecting plaque. And not only can it be helpful for deciding decisions about statins, but it's also been incorporated in some guidelines for making decisions about non-statins and aspirin therapy, like the statement from the NLA um, two years ago that we know from these studies that when the calcium score is above 300, the event rate is similar to a stable secondary prevention population, similar to like a four-year population, the stable four-year population. So because it's uh, similar to a secondary prevention population, we have sort of similar goals where it's reasonable that um, to, and if you need to add on non-statin therapy to achieve a 50% reduction in LDL and targeting an LDL less than 70. So treating, you know, this is about the risk spectrum and treating this more like a secondary prevention population. Um, and also modeling data from MESA. So this wasn't based on a trial. This is based on modeling data from observational studies. But patients with a calcium score above 100 seem to have a high enough event rate where there may be a net benefit from statin therapy as long as they're at low risk for bleeding. So we've kind of backed off a bit with aspirin and primary prevention, but high calcium scores is one of the groups that I still use um, uh, aspirin therapy in because uh, um, they have a uh, disease. But really it's important to have a clinician patient risk discussion because um, patients have different preferences and beliefs and desires about um, their desires and wishes for primary prevention for ASCVD. And there's a lot of things to factor in how much an individual patient would benefit from additional risk reduction, any drug-drug interactions, the cost of therapy, which is, um, can be significant for some of these newer agents um, and patients' own preferences. So, you know, we have these guidelines that recommend these targets, but what's happening in real world practice? Well, unfortunately, um, we're not doing very good. This is US data and it's kind of similar or worse in, in Europe um, uh, from the gold registry. So these are all secondary prevention patients, ASCVD patients. And yet, you know, two thirds of patients remained above an LDL above 70. So uh, where, you know, a third remained above an LDL over a hundred and PCSK9 inhibitors were sorely underutilized, less than 5% here. And over a two year period, only 17% had their lipid lowering therapy intensified. So we're just kind of sitting on these patients and we're not getting them to goal. And you know, it makes a lot of sense, but drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. And one of the greatest challenges is uh, adherence of lipids. And some of these newer ages may help. Um, this is some data from the VA study, again, looking at um, just statin therapy and mortality in patients with ASCVD and looking at the, the medication possession ratio as a marker of adherence, that mortality was greatest in patients who were not adherent to their statin. And this is similar in a large UK registry, three large uh, primary care registries where they also had um, pharmacy data and showed that the greatest reduction in cardiovascular risk were their patients that were prescribed a high intensity statin and were actually adherent by their medication possession ratio. Um, this, um, in the same paper, they superimposed this with the LDL and it, it matched the LDL exactly that you have lower LDL with high intensity statins and actually taking the medicine and being adherent. So it's really important that um, we emphasize this, but unfortunately some data suggests that, you know, about 50% of patients are not at their statin, on their statin one year after prescribed. And, um, you know, there, uh, there's certainly a nocebo effect. Um, but you know, a lot of patients for them, the muscle associated symptoms are real. But keep in mind, very few patients have complete intolerance. Um, most patients have partial intolerance and can take some statins. So it's important to kind of try to re-challenge um, and uh, use alternate therapy. Sometimes, you know, I use three times a week statin and try different things. But the guidelines do say for these very high risk patients, if you've tried at least two, you don't have to go exhaustively through all six statins and try everything. We wanna get patients to goal and we have a lot more agents that we can move on. So I wanted to uh, make sure I also talk about lipoprotein A, which is an emerging um, target. It's strongly genetically determined. About 90% is based on um, the, the gene you have for the LPA. Um, so unfortunately diet and lifestyle don't make much difference in bumping the LD, A level. 
but um, it does um, go up uh, during pregnancy and then comes back down. It, there is a little increase after menopause, which sort of challenges the notion that you only need to measure it once in someone's lifetime. It also can go up in kidney disease. Um, but so it has an ApoB moiety, so it's one of those bad particles, but it also has this ApoA moiety, and I'll talk about this, has this um, Pringle repeats at the Pringle of four two domain, which can be very variable. It can um, be anywhere copies between four to 40 different copies. And so people can have different molar sizes based on this. And that gets important with, when we talk about units um, of measurements. But it's thought to be contributed to pathogenesis of both um, calcific aortic valve disease and atherosclerosis by being proatherogenic, proinflammatory, prothrombotic. And um, the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies in Clozerin have some effect on it, but there are emerging therapies specifically trying to target and knock out this poke gene. So here's an example of this Pringle repeats. It can repeat anywhere from 44 times to 40 times. So the people can have different sizes. And actually, most patients can have two different sizes, you know, one from each parent. Um, and so this um, can lead to some issues with the assays. So you really want to have an isoform independent assay to measure the true lipoprotein A burden. And it also leads to imprecise conversion between milligrams per deciliter to nanomoles per liter because there's different sizes. And so milligrams per deciliter is, is capturing the concentration of cholesterol in these particles. Uh, compared to the molar units, and guidelines um, have uh, really preferred now moving to the molar units, nanomoles per liter. But um, so it matters when patients, when you're talking about elevated levels, that you're talking about the units and we're speaking the same language with units. So it's an imprecise conversion. Um, but you know, if you look at this threshold above 50 milligrams per deciliter and above 120 nanomoles per liter, um, it's estimated that 20 to 25% of the global population have levels above this threshold. So it's pretty common when you start looking for it. And there is a racial ethnic variability probably due to genetics where levels tend to be higher in black persons and persons of South Asian descent. But there's lots of lines of evidence suggesting it's um, causal in ASCBD. We have both um, meta-analyses um, from uh, observational studies showing that the level is correlated with risk of, of major adverse cardiovascular events. Uh, we have genetic studies as well, showing that the, your genetically predicted levels or the gene that you have predict risk. And uh, there's also data um, from this large uh, co-op collaboration showing both uh, increased risk from um, observational data for MACE uh, and stroke, but doesn't seem to be increased risk for non-cardiovascular death. And we also see uh, increased risk for calcific aortic stenosis. Uh, but genes are not destiny. And it is nice to note, at least in this cohort, that individuals, despite having high levels, if they did follow a healthy lifestyle, they did have lower risk than people with high levels that um, uh, didn't follow a healthy lifestyle. So there's a lot that we can do to tell you know, patients to encourage them to follow healthy lifestyle changes. Now, there's a lot of variability around the guidelines of recommending who to measure this in just because of um, you know, what to do with the levels. Most guidelines do recommend measuring in people with ASCVD, a personal history or a strong family history. I tend to um, follow more like the European and Canadian guidelines, which is to me measure at least once in a, a person's lifetime because it's so genetically determined that um, you, know, you can um, often measure someone once to find the patients with a really high uh, lipoprotein A level. Um, in terms of therapies, unfortunately, statins don't lower lipoprotein A. And one um, um, possible mechanism for statin intolerance and in reducing LDL may be that the patient actually has elevated lipoprotein A, and that's why their LDL may not be going down. But we still use statins to over lower their vascular risk. PCSK9 and enclizerin kind of lower it by about 25%. And then there's some new emerging therapies. Uh, but I just want to mention with PCSK9 inhibitors in the four year trial, that this was again um, focused on LDL lowering, but patients in the four-year trial who had higher lipoprotein A derived a greater absolute and relative risk reduction benefit from PCSK9 inhibitor. So if I have a patient, especially a high-risk patient, secondary prevention, who have elevated LDL and elevated lipoprotein A, I tend to kind of move to the PCSK9 inhibitors more quickly because they do re reduce lipoprotein A. And in the four-year trial, the absolute reduction in MACE seem to be uh, related to the reduction of lipoprotein A. And just briefly, there are some new agents that are moving into phase three trials. 
pelicarsins, an antisense oligonucleotide that's prevent, per, uh, blocking the synthesis of this protein um, and can reduce lipoprotein A by 80 to 90 percent. Um, Opasarin is a small interfering RNA that also can block the synthesis of this protein. Uh, and the Ocean A dose trial um, got almost 100 percent reduction in this protein. So these agents work in knocking out the protein. But the big question um, is, what does this translate to in MACE? If we lower lipergyl A by these agents, how much can we lower vascular events? And we don't know that, but there are two large outcome trials that have been launching, um, investigating these new agents in 2025 and 2026 um, that hopefully will um, provide some light on this. And maybe if these are successful, these agents will get approved. And just one other note, I mentioned aspirin primary prevention. There is modeling data from the Women's Health Initiative and also from the Women's Health Study and also from the ESPRI study of aspirin, suggesting that patients with genotypes of lipergyl A elevation may derive a net benefit from aspirin. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we, again, we moved away from aspirin for primary prevention, but elevated lipergyl A patients may benefit. And so that's um, one of the considerations I use in this population. So in conclusion, for LDL, lower is better for cardiovascular outcomes, and the longer the duration of being lower is better. That statin treatment patients continue to have events despite statin treatment, and that these non-statin therapies provide the same risk reduction per millimole per liter LDL lowering, and are now endorsed by guidelines, but implementation in clinical practice lags behind guidelines, and adherence remains one of the greatest challenges, but um, we have new options available to address both issues. And uh, just a plug for the journal you heard I was an editor for. So if you're interested in preventive cardiology, I encourage you to read our journal and submit to our journal. We're the official journal of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology. And if you're a trainee, a, a resident, or fellow, you can join our society for free. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mikos. That was a great talk. I think we have time for a few questions. At, up in the top deck. Um, yeah, so the question was between the two monoclonal um, uh, PCSK9 antibodies, evolacumab and alaracumab, what do I choose between them? Really, it comes down to insurance. I mean, I showed you the data where they seem to have similar reduction in LDL, similar reduction in MACE. Um, certain pairs might prefer one on formulary versus the other. Uh, I tend to use more evolacumab because you don't have to do a dose adjustment. There is a dose adjustment with alaracumab. Um, uh, and the, you know, there's a, the pen injector with evolacumab is really easy to use, but really it comes down to whichever one that the insurance will cover. <laughs> yeah, so he was talking about early initiation in the hospital, which is a hot topic with PCSK9 inhibitors. And I, I hope we are moving to that. I and mean, it's not in the guidelines yet, but there are now several studies that she's looking at post-MI patients and show that you can give PCSK9 in the hospital setting and it's safe and actually um, leads to sort of sustained LDL lowering. Because we know that if you initiate medicines in the hospital, you're more likely to be uptaked and do so. I'm really hoping we move for that because we showed it's safe and we show it's beneficial. And I think that would be a, a great strategy. Um, it's just not in the guidelines yet, but um, you know, there's lots of data also looking at, you know, plaque reduction with PCSK9, and um, so it, it's, a, it's a great question. Yeah, so the question is about statins in pregnancy. So you may know, at least the FDA has removed the highest, the most stringent label. So it's no longer a category X. 
So this let, gives you some more flexible options with talking to patients. Um, Sounds are probably not teratogenic. This is based on, the, the concern was really based on animal studies where they were given massive doses of statins and earlier uncontrolled studies um, that suggested congenital abnormalities. But then there's been more data that emerged since then about patients that became pregnant on statins and they didn't see any congenital abnormalities. So they're probably not teratogenic, but we do have limited data. So um, in you know, this, now you have more flexible options. So in your highest risk patients, if you do have a woman who had an MI, uh, an atherosclerotic MI, not a SCAD MI, um, you, you, know, you, they, you can continue statins during pregnancy. Um, most patients, because you're really thinking about lifetime risk, that pregnancy and breastfeeding are relatively a short duration that you can potentially come off of it. Um, so counsel them about um, conception and when they're planning to, to become pregnant, stop the statin and then um, restart it when the pregnancy is over and breastfeeding is over. But if they were to become accidentally pregnant on statins, we just stop statins when the pregnancy is identified. And I reassure the patient, it's probably not teratogenic. Um, you know, we, again, it depends on the risk level. You can use bile acid sequestrants, but they're not really tolerated well in pregnancy because of their constipating. And the last thing a pregnant woman needs is more constipation. Some of those other agents though, there's no pregnancy data or they're contraindicated for like the new agents I'm talking about. But it's an interesting, the field is emerging. So statins are being investigated as a treatment for preeclampsia. Um, in animal models, the statins improve endothelial function and inhibit um, S-split. Um, and uh, some of these inflammatory markers, it seems to prevent preeclampsia in animal models. And so there's a large study going on now where they're giving, in women at high risk for preeclampsia, where they're giving the statin at 12 weeks. So right after the first trimester, pravastatin compared to placebo, and that's ongoing and, and see if statins can prevent preeclampsia. And if that's successful, then the whole pendulum may have shift from avoiding statins in pregnancy to actually using statins in pregnancy for preeclampsia prevention. So it's a, it's a great thought, but this is a, um, lipids do go up during pregnancy. So if you have a woman with FH or really high triglycerides, it'd be best uh, an ideal setting for them to see a lipid specialist before becoming pregnant so that you can help optimize things uh, uh, during pregnancy. <laughs> Dr. Goldberg, I'm sure you have lots to add on this topic. Yes. So again, uh, primordial prevention, you know, we're thinking trying to prevent risk factors from developing in the first place, primary prevention for treating risk factors and secondary prevention, they already have disease. So uh, I definitely, I'm very interested in, and we talked about the lifetime exposure of LDL. And if we can just shift everyone for lower to longer, I think, unfortunately, we wait too late. You know, a lot of these studies, we're talking about treating higher risk patients who already have disease. And I showed you that data that you get a much greater relative risk reduction of coronary disease if you start earlier. And I think we ignore um, a lot of LDLs and younger adults in 20s and 30s. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of FH is missed and not treated. There seems to be a reluctance of treating young adults, even those with FH or likely FH. And then we, you know, give them a disservice because they end up having, um, you know, earlier onset ASCVD. So for, you know, teenagers and young adults who, who don't have FH, um, really trying to focus on healthier lifestyle, you know, although a lot of lipids, uh, LDL is genetically determined, you know, diet can influence about 20 to 30% of it. And so, um, especially for those individuals, if we can shift the uh, whole population to lower through lifestyle changes, but not to miss FH and um, the importance of cascade screening, because for children, if they're children of parents uh, with FH, if you can start treatment early, like even in you know childhood, you can prevent their whole trajectory that they won't develop ASCVD at the same onset as their parents. And so really, really important to start treating early, both in FH, but also um, in general primary prevention. That's great. Thank you yeah. so much. That was a really great talk. <laughs> Wonderful job. Well, it worked for the slides. It just, they just disappeared. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Yeah.